Thank you, Dr. Sanford. When I was given this book, I looked at the title and I thought, man, that's intimidating. You know, what do I know about the human genome? What do I know about genetic entropy? I, I, I knew a little bit about entropy, a little bit about genes, but I got to tell you, your book has been a, a revelation for me. And it's uh, written from your perspective as, um, as, a, as a prof with a background in, in, um, in, bi in biology or botany or... Well, my, my training was in agricultural research in genetics and involved crop improvement. So breeding improved crop plants and then later being involved in the genetic engineering of crop plants. Right. So, and genetic engineering, of course, is still a kind of a, 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 bad, a bad code word out there in the world, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I know countries in Africa, for instance, Zambia specifically, who won't allow mm -hmm. uh, genetically uh, modified uh, corn. Mm -hmm. to come to their nation as much as they need it mm -hmm. because they're afraid that if they eat this corn, they're going to grow horns or something. Right. Uh, there is a stigma attached to it. Yeah. Um, I, I actually uh, think that the engineering of crops is really crucial to feeding a hungry world, but, um, but I understand people's concerns. And I actually, since I really haven't been involved with it for over 10 years, I um, pretty much stepped back from that controversy. I, I guess I feel there is better... Uh, more urgent things to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. But in the process of this discipline and this work, you, uh, you have an insight into uh, the genome that is quite unique. Mm -hmm. Now, for the sake of uh, people who have not encountered that word before, what does genome denote? So the genome is the, all of our genetic material combined. So it's all the genes on all our chromosomes. And it's made up of approximately 3 billion letters, which is... Uh, a vast amount of information. It's like many, many sets of encyclopedias. And it's basically an instruction manual on how to build a human cell and how to build a human body. Or actually, more accurately, it's, it's, it's less like a book than a, um, than a computer program. It's like an operating system, but it's vastly superior to any operating system man has developed. Yeah, there's nothing that we've come up with yet that can come close, right? Nothing can come close. In fact, we, as every year, we realize that it's more and more marvelous uh, than we thought. Now, was it you or another one of the scientists that I'm interviewing who said if you were to unravel uh, our, um, our DNA and, and, and put these ladders end to end, it would go around the earth something like three and a half million times or something? Uh, All the DNA in our body, yeah. that, that's true, but that's partly because we have so many cells in our body. Yeah, what, three trillion or something? Uh, I think over a hundred trillion cells. hundred trillion? Yes. Uh, but um, you know, once you get into trillions, just oh. to say there's many trillions is enough. That's astonishing. Yeah, so we're, we are a galaxy of um, design and complexity and amazing functionality, but it's the genome it has all the information that enables that. So it's like the, it's, it's just an amazing uh, information system. How long has it been since the uh, genome was uh, fully mapped? Well, the genome was uh, largely completed uh, around 2000, 2001, um, but they've been still actually filling in the gaps. There are still parts of the genome that have not yet been sequenced. Wow. Yeah. Now, have you had anything to do with the... Uh the uh, unraveling of the map? Have you been involved at all on that no, level? No, I wasn't involved in the sequencing of the yeah. genome, but I was uh, very, uh, very excited to see it um, develop. Now, this happened uh, right in the middle of your career, or t maybe towards the end of your career. Mm -hmm. uh, as someone whose whole life has revolved around genetics, uh, has this thing uh, been a revelation to you, this, this genome? I pretty much all the biologists and geneticists I know during the last 10 years, I think, have been awed by uh, the complexity and uh, the, the marvelous nature of the genome. Uh, bef when the genome was first unveiled, it was announced uh, to be largely junk. And that was consistent with kind of the philosophy. Junk of, DNA. Junk DNA was yeah. a dominant um, <clears throat> concept. In 2007, the ENCODE project was completed. That was phase two of the genome project. And the uh, the ENCODE project was looking at the functionality of the genome. And to everyone's surprise, this was a huge project. This involved hundreds of scientists and, and vast amounts of money, scientists from all over the world, to do the ENCODE project, just like the genome project. What they found was that uh, the genome is amazingly functional. And not, over 90% of the genome is actively transcribed, and that doesn't 
there's probably more, but we have to study more carefully to find the function of the remaining part of the genome. And um, more than that, uh, the genome has multiple overlapping, overlapping messages. Try to imagine a book in a chapter and that hidden, embedded in that chapter, in addition to the obvious meaning of the, of the words in the chapter, are other messages. And the, even in the same sentences, there might be several messages embedded. Uh, and even more astounding is, you know, the DNA has two strands, one running one way and one running the other. For the longest time, they thought the one strand was just for replication and all the information was on the other strand. Just one strand had information. What they found with the ENCODE project was more than 50% of the genome, uh, both strands are read. So it's like reading a sentence forward, so it has one meaning, and reading it backwards, and there's another message there. So it's data compression on the most uh, sophisticated level. Wow. And, and as you suggest in your book, there, there may be other aspects to data compression that have yet to be discovered, like, like almost uh, several dimensions, you know, or three or four dimensional or whatever the case may be. It is multidimensional, and one of the things that DNA does, it, it, it's like a, a, a tape with letters on it, and you can read it in a linear way, but it also folds up like origami, and you can make huge architectural structures that fill the genome. And the func we're just starting to understand that all that folding uh, is like uh, the folding of a protein, functional, and it carries information. Now, this has got to be a challenge to the evolutionary worldview, uh, where so much is credited to randomness and uh, length of time mm -hmm. and, and uh, natural selection over billions of years. Um, are those who are deeply committed to the evolutionary perspective uh, beginning to acknowledge that uh, these discoveries, especially this ENCODE project, is uh, information that they hadn't had to process before and it is impacting their worldview? Or are they saying, uh, no, it, uh, it's affirming our worldview? I don't think anyone's saying it affirms their worldview because mm. it's becoming extremely problematic to explain how the genome could arise and how these multiple levels of overlapping information could arise. Since our best computer programmers can't even conceive of overlapping codes, um, what we're seeing is, and, and our best, the genome dwarfs uh, all of the computer information technology uh, that man has developed. So I think that, yes, it's very problematic to imagine how you could achieve that through uh, random changes in the, in the code. Uh, it was, it's, a, you know, no one, th even computer viruses are designed. And so there's not a, it, within all the programs of your computer, there's not a single zero or one that's there by chance, and there's no junk DNA in these codes. Well, uh, more and more, the genome looks like a super, super set of programs, and it's very hard to imagine how that came together. It all, it, more and more, it looks like top-down design and not just bottom-up chance discovery of wake, making complex systems work. I love your, uh, <clears throat> your metaphor of the uh, princess and the pea. Uh, as you try to explain for the average person like me what's going on here. Mm -hmm. uh, walk us through that illustration. Okay. Um, you know the story of the princess is the pea. I do. So, of course, uh, she proved her, her special noble character because even with many mattresses, she could still feel that there was a pea under her mattress. And that proved that she was royalty, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's a cute story. Um, in terms of genetics, what we have is a huge genome, three billion letters, and what we have are chance mutations in this information system, which would be like changing zeros and ones in a computer program. And so you have these, these mutations are overwhelmingly deleterious. You could imagine a zero or one change in a computer program would make it better. It's just phenomenally unlikely. Mm -hmm. And so the same thing is happening in the genome, and the mutation rate is extremely high. So it turns out that we have uh, about three mutations every cell division in our body, which is just astounding. Which makes you and me both mutants. We're getting more mutant every day. <laughs> yeah. So we, we're adding about three new mutations per cell per day. It's just absolutely mm -hmm. astounding. Um, so all these mutations are coming in, and they have tiny effects. If you change one letter in a genome of three billion, how much of the information have you lost? Very little, but you have lost some information. If you don't stop this process, you're going to destroy all the information. If you scramble the letters of the book, eventually it will have no information. And so uh, um, 
The typical mutation has too small of an effect on our fitness or our total functionality to be measurable. Now, we have some mutations where you can see an effect, like hemophilia, and you say, okay, that person has a mutation, there's a specific letter change that causes a severe disease. But the typical mutation is not detectable in any way by any medical technology. We can see that a genome has changed a letter, but we can't know how that's affected the workings of that person. And so the princess and the pea analogy is saying uh, mother nature, which or natural selection, mm -hmm. is the princess, and there are these tiny changes, many levels removed. Like Braille, you say in your book. Right. So um, basically, selection happens for the whole individual. Yeah. So I, I'm 100 trillion cells, and I contain uh, in every cell there's 6 billion nucleotides. And so uh, Mother Nature is going to decide if my body is going to be selected or not, if to the extent that selection works at all. And so um, Mother Nature can't see a single nucleotide change. She's going to change. She's going to choose my whole genome. I have good genes and bad genes mixed together, and she's just going to say at the at the whole organism level, there's either survival or reproduction, which is survival or there is um, death or non-reproduction. And uh, the idea that Mother Nature can sort out what's happening at just above the atomic level as these letters change within our genome is really unthinkable.